Okay, bonjour. Um, today I want to talk a bit about zoonoses, so how viruses jump from animals to humans to emerge and cause disease. And of course, as my case study, I want to talk about COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, because that's where we are at the moment in the middle of a, a global pandemic. So for a number of years now, I've been working closely with collaborators in China, and we've gone sampling in different parts in that country. So we often go to rural areas in China. This is a photograph I took in Zhejiang province in Southeast China. And we go there and you can sample rodents and different animals around people's homes. You can also find nearby to these villages, you can find caves. And if you put on your personal protective equipment, that's me in my PPE, I, I probably wear better PPE today. If you go in there, you will find bats. And so myself and my collaborators in China over many years now have sampled bats and their viruses from around China. And it turns out that bats carry lots of viruses and they contain, and particularly lots and lots of coronaviruses. So here's a paper we wrote in 2017 that just describes some of this amazing diversity of coronaviruses in bats in China. And in, in that particular study, the study where I'm, I'm dressed up there, we found coronaviruses that were rather like the one that's now emerged. Not identical, but pretty similar. Um, interestingly, the ones in red on the tree there, they are coronaviruses from bats in Hubei. And of course, Hubei province is where Wuhan is, where the first disease was first appeared. So bats in the local population do carry coronaviruses. And in this paper, as many people also warned, we said these viruses have a chance, these bat viruses, of jumping to humans and being a threat to public health. So we warned that was going to happen, as did other people. And of course, that's what's happened with COVID-19. We didn't listen to these particular warnings. So if we wind forward to the end of last year, start of this year, that's when COVID-19 first emerged. And I've described a little bit now about what happened at that time. I was actually involved in the very early understanding of, of, of the outbreak. And so like many people, I first heard about um, this new virus on ProMed. ProMed is a kind of a website um, where they give it on a, a daily list of, of new emerging diseases. So I heard about um, this new pneumonia. So you see here it's December the 30th last year. It was about an undiagnosed pneumonia in China. It was about four cases of pneumonia in Wuhan. And it mentions this fit the seafood market in Wuhan. So that's the first thing. So then in contact with colleagues in, in China, I was very interested because Wuhan is a place that I've worked in quite a lot. So my colleagues in China, we sampled a lot of animals around Hubei province. It was a kind of key sampling area for us. And in 2016, I even went to Wuhan Central Hospital and gave a seminar. You see, see my name's just in there as I gave a talk. And of course, when, when during the early outbreak in Wuhan, Wuhan Central Hospital was a, was a, very, was a key place. So, so I've, I've been there. And actually, I've actually been to this, this seafood market as well. So my key colleague here in China is Professor Zhongzheng Zhang, who works at Fudan University. And we had collaborators in, in Wuhan. So we started, you know, we were sampling patients and animals in that population. And so on January the 5th, Professor Zhang's team managed to sequence the complete genome of, of this new virus causing this, this pneumonia in Wuhan. Now, a variety of other teams also sequenced the genome. Professor Zhang was one of the teams that, that, that did it. So we had it on, on January the 5th, and the Ministry of Health in China was informed on the same day, and that sequence was sent, the genome sequence of, of this new virus was sent to NIH GenBank, so they could store that sequence on that day. Then going forward a few days, on January the 11th, Australian time, Italian time, January the 10th in the US, I posted that sequence on a website called Virological, and here's my Twitter post saying I posted it there. And that was the first ever report of this novel coronavirus, the first genome sequence released to the public. And from then, people could start to make diagnostic tests. That's a kind of key moment in the epidemic. And of course, once we had the first sequence, we could begin to try and work out where, what it was related to, you know, where it might come from. And very early on with that first sequence, we realized it was close to SARS-1, so close to the SARS coronavirus that emerged in 2002, 2003. And it's also close to some viruses from bats and other coronaviruses, like those ones in those bats I described earlier. 
So here's a very early tree. Here's SARS-CoV-2 here. Then it was back in January, it's called N2019 CO, NCOV, there's SARS-2. That's the first SARS virus there. There's MERS virus that causes a very nasty disease in humans still. And there are a few other less serious coronaviruses that infect humans. One here called OC43, one here called HKU1, which I mentioned at the end. But key, the ones in black, they're all from bats. So you can see that SARS-1 and 2 are very closely related to some bat coronaviruses, suggesting that bats have played a key role in the origin. Of course, also once we have the full genome sequence, we could start to look more about some other <coughs> features of, of, of the genome. So here's the genome. It's like a very, very standard coronavirus. This in grey, most of that's the kind of polymerase that the virus uses to copy. Over here is the spike protein on, on the, outer, the outer surface, the protein. The spike protein itself has a number of key features, particularly there are two I've, I've highlighted here. One is called the receptor binding domain. That's that bit there. And that's the bit that binds to the host cell receptor. And very early on, we could see that the, the, the receptor binding domain in SARS-CoV-2 was rather different to the one in SARS-CoV-1. That was kind of interesting. And most of all, and this has caused a lot of discussion, um, the spike protein you can um, gene has split into two, one called S1, S, one called S2, and there's a cleavage site between them. And at that cleavage site in the human virus here, SARS-CoV-2, there's an assertion of four polybasic amino acids. And that's a signature for protease called furin to cleave at that site. So it's, a, so it's called a furin cleavage insertion site. And that was rather unusual to see that in, 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 a, in a coronavirus. It's not that insertion is, is not found in the viruses over here, most closely related to, 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 to SARS-CoV-2 but it is found in some other beta coronaviruses. And a lot of debate about where that, that, where that might come from. The, the, the best, the theory I like most of all is from a guy called Bill Gallagher in the US. And Bill has shown there's a bat virus called HKU9 has a very similar sequence to this furin cleavage site. So maybe in the history of, of these viruses, there was some kind of a combination event that's allowed this, this, vir this virus, this cleavage site to enter the bat virus that eventually produced SARS-CoV-2. So then what is the animal reservoir? I've already mentioned that bats are, are really key and it's been a lot of work in the past and is ongoing into what might be the origin of, 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 of this virus. And we know, as I said, we know that bats carry lots of viruses that are like SARS-CoV-2. So very recently, Peter Dazat's group published a very nice paper. It's now in, in Nature Communications where they've just gone and sampled lots of bats around China look at the diversity of viruses they carry. And there's a huge number of these coronaviruses. So here's their evolutionary tree, drawn in a slightly different way. And the key thing is the kind of bluey and the purple colors, they are all coronaviruses from bats, the genus Rhinolophus. So these Rhinolophus bats, these horseshoe bats, it's kind of horseshoe face there, they contain lots of these coronaviruses. In particular, this, there's SARS-1, there's SARS this is SARS-2, the, the closest relatives to SARS-CoV-2 in purple, they are two horseshoe bat coronaviruses, one called RATG13, one called RMYN02, and they're very close. So RATG13 is the closest relative to SARS-CoV-2 across the whole genome, but RMYN02 is the closest relative in the, in the uh, polymerase gene. Okay, so they're both very close. What's also really interesting is that the ones in green, they're also very close, and they're from Malayan pangolins. And these pangolins, they're, because they're, they're not from China, they're from Mal Malaya, and they are basically import, smuggled into China. So they were captured by local customs authorities in different places in China. And these animals were sick, these smuggled pangolins. And amazingly, they have coronaviruses that are very close to SARS-CoV-2 in sequence, particularly the ones that were smuggled into Guangdong province in China. They're the receptor binding domain in these pangolin viruses is very close to the receptor binding domain in the human virus. So somehow the evolutionary history of these viruses, pangolins have been infected with a virus that's very similar also to SARS-CoV-2. But despite all this, we're not exactly sure yet what the reservoir host for the virus is and quite how it's got into humans. Because although these viruses look very close to SARS-CoV-2, these ones here, in fact, the closest viruses are still about 30 years away, at least 30 years away. So there's an evolutionary gap of at least 30 years. Of course, a lot could happen in that space. We haven't yet quite found the absolute ancestor of SARS-CoV-2 yet. We need to sample more to, to work that out. 
also, as the virus has spread through humans, it's also then in, enter some other animal populations. So cats, we know, get infected. And also, very interestingly, mink. So we know that in the Netherlands, there's been a big outbreak of, of SARS-CoV-2 in mink, in mink farms. So it's gone from humans to mink, and then it's actually gone from mink back to humans. So mink are clearly also a receptive animal host. So it could be lots of animals out there that carry these viruses that are like SARS-CoV-2 that we've not yet sampled. That's a key thing to do. Now, pangolins are very interesting because it turns out, as I mentioned, they have a disease, these animals are sick, and their disease actually looks very like human COVID-19. So if you take, take, take do a chest um, CT scan of a pangolin, it looks rather like a human chest CT scan. They have various tissue um, disorders that are like human SARS-CoV-2, so it's very similar. The genes, when the pangolin has a virus, the genes that the pangolin up and down regulates when they're infected are very similar to those in humans. So they're very similar kind of disease manifestation. Also, it looks like the pangolin may even pass their virus vertically from adult to, to fetus. It's actually very interesting. So it looks like it, the pangolins probably in Guangdong, they're a single outbreak, okay? And they probably got it quite recently and they're probably not the reservoir host because they are so ill. So quite the role played by pangolins is unclear, but it's amazing they suffer a very similar disease to human COVID-19. So again, we don't know the, answer, the real origin of the virus yet. It's still a source of debate. But although that's, that may bother some people, it's not really unexpected. If you remember, it took two years to find that bats were the cause of SARS-CoV-1. It took 10 years or so to find that chimps the ancestor of, of HIV, and we still don't know the ancestor of hepatitis C virus. It may take a little while to, to work out. Um, so then the virus has spread, and using those genome sequences, I'm sure you hear more about that from Graziano Pezzolo shortly, we know that the virus, all the diversity we see at the moment, has a common ancestor that dates around about November last year. So probably the virus emerged in humans very shortly before it was detected in December, very close to that. That global diversity you can split into two lineages, A and B, and these both diversified in Wuhan. In fact, most of the diversity you see globally originated in Wuhan and then spread globally. And A and B differ by only two mutations. And those famous wet market ones, they're in fact lineage B. And then you can subdivide B, that's the one that's really spread globally into different sub-lineages that are spread all around the world. And in Italy, very early on, the, the, the lineage that spread uh, the most um, widely was, was called B1. I'm sure you'll hear about that in a, in a, shortly. And B1 contains this famous 614G mutation, the spike, that some people have argued may increase transmissibility, particularly in, in cell assays. So there's a huge diversity of these viruses around. They're very closely related, but there are a lot of diversity. And we, some colleagues in Edinburgh, Andrew Rambo's group, have, have developed a tool called pangolin this is the logo it's pretty cool and you can take your sequence and it tells you which lineage these amazing number of lineages out there your virus works falls into so it's, so it's pretty interesting so kind of key question is why why coronaviruses why do coronaviruses so commonly jump species boundaries and, and they really do so here's a here's a simple comparative experiment here on on the left hand side it, uh, is uh, these this is the hantaviruses Again, you go to China, you sample animals, you see lots of hantaviruses. This is a tree of hantaviruses on this side. This is a tree of the, the vertebrate hosts, the mammal hosts, those hantaviruses have come from. And you can see the kind of almost direct mirror images of each other. So the hantaviruses are not jumping species boundaries very, very um, often. If you then look at coronaviruses in contrast, here's a tree of the coronaviruses, here's a tree, so here's a tree of the viruses, here's a tree of the hosts. You see all that kind of that jumble of lines, that is endless host jumping. So coronaviruses just have an ability to really commonly jump host species boundaries for reasons that we're not particularly sure about, but they really do. So coronaviruses are clearly one to watch. And in fact, SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh human coronaviruses we've documented to date, documented so far. Four of those cause mild disease, um, they're called 229EHKU1NL63 OC43. And threes cause severe disease like SARS CoV 1, MERS, and SARS CoV 2. Amazingly, five of the seven have 
emerge in the last 20 years. SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV-2, uh, HKU1, NL6, and then NL63. And bats are also emerged, involved in emergence of numbers. So these are clear, these viruses are jumping all the time into humans. And it's no surprise that this happened again. Let's give you a kind of really important warning shot. HKU1, so, um, coronavirus HK1, which people don't really talk about at all, this virus emerged in Shenzhen, Hong Kong, 2005, has an unknown animal reservoir. It's most close related to, to some rodent ones like mouse hepatitis virus, but exactly where it comes from is not clear. It contains a furring cleavage site and initially it was associated with pneumonia. So only 15 years ago, we had a warning, we had a warning from Asia on an animal coronavirus that could cause serious disease and we just ignored it. And that was our, and we've, made, we've consistently made mistakes here. And since to me, it's pretty obvious that SARS-CoV-2 will become endemic in humans. It will, it will continue to stay around. And you can predict very clearly that more coronaviruses will emerge in the future. So I want to stop there. I hope that's very brief. I hope you um, uh, have, have learned something. Um, I haven't really got time to go through all the people involved. Obviously, I have lots of collaborators. Let me show you one picture. This is this is when I, that photograph I took in Wuhan Central Hospital. That was the outside. This is the inside of the hospital. And this is the infectious disease ward in 2016. So there's me and this Professor Zhang. You can imagine, imagine how, um, how calm that is now, but how chaotic it would have been in, in January when these people were um, doing amazing work to control this uh, infection. So these people really are heroes, what they did in Wuhan back in early part of this year. Thank you.